so chapter two is really that's the meat of the geometric optics because in chapter one you i think the things that you see in chapter one you kind of knew them already reflection refraction snow's law if you've taken any kind of uh, physics or physical science class in high school i think you would have seen that so so um so chapter two is uh, the chapter that covers some things that might be new although i guess um, here still I think uh, a lot of the topics here are likely to have been covered in your high school physics class if you have taken high school physics so um so let me just point out a few things that i think uh, are conceptually important and uh, tend to be uh, missed by people to their detriment. Um, so uh, section 2.1, which describes image, I, I think uh, the concept of image is really important. So what it describes about play mirrors themselves, they are, you know, nothing surprising. Everyone here is familiar with the mirrors. If we have an object here, you are looking at it through the mirror. You see an image that appears on the other side at the roughly the same distance from uh, you know, the distance of DO and distance DI is about the same. What I want to emphasize is um, what the nature of this image is. The image is where, um, where the thing that we are looking at through an optical element appears to be. And it uh, kind of appears, the, appears to be in every sense of that phrase as in, Imagine this, um, it's the scenario where you are looking at an image this way uh, through the mirror. And then let's say you closed your eye for a moment. And in that moment, someone removed this mirror and actually placed the actual object, uh, bottle of pills at this location where the image was. When you open your eyes again, you shouldn't be able to tell the difference. If the mirror was ideal, if the mirror didn't have markings or something, so you couldn't notice the absence of mirror, then the way things appear to us, there is no difference between the light rays that come directly from an object, as in, you know, if this pill bottle is here and the light, light rays come directly, versus if the light rays go through a mirror and come to us, they should have they have no difference. So where this, uh, um, what we're gonna call virtual image is, it serves as a usual abstraction because uh, we could almost pretend that um, for the purpose of optics analysis, we can pretend that there is an actual object here that's uh, producing its light. And that's what we are seeing. And in terms of analysis, we'll get the exact same result. And this is section tries to describe how that happens. So from each of these points, it's drawing two nearby light rays. So that with these two uh, nearby light rays, which are slightly diverging, you can see that um, these slightly diverging rays, if you imagine where they originate from, your eyes and brain will interpret these two slightly diverging rays as originating from this point here. And that's how the image forms. So this section that describes um, image information by plane mirrors, the result itself is, you know, it's a simple result, but it's in the setting like this where you, it's uh, uh, easier to understand the abstract concept. So I would do encourage you to uh, spend enough time making sure that you don't overlook the, the concept of image that, uh, you know, multiple images and how, um, for example, in locating this image too, you would use the um, use the light from this. So you know this is the object. Image one would be the first image that's formed by mirror one. What's labeled as image three, that is an image of an image. So the back of the head here forms this thing that textbook labels as image two through mirror two. And this and this, uh, you know, this image is at a location where you know it's behind your head. You can't see it directly, so you can form a second image, treating this like an object, ignoring mirror two. You can see what kind of image this image forms through mirror one, and that's image three. 
And in terms of light that makes it into your eye, that's the image. And so, you know, and because you are, you know what mirrors are, you know how these are arranged, you can kind of figure out, oh, the image I'm seeing here, it's what I'm seeing through mirrors one and two. And if you <laughs> ignore the how mirrors work for a bit, then what you see as image through here will look exactly like this. So, so that's that section. Um, so uh, spherical mirrors, the, I think a geometric argument here is really good to read through. In fact, um, the parabolic mirror, if you remember our reading session on Wednesday, the section we read, uh, Feynman actually went through the argument showing that uh, you want a parabolic mirror to focus on something at a far distance away to a single point. Um, the derivation you will see me do in lecture will use a spherical mirror. So this is the, or spherical mirror with the paraxial rays. And what this uh, part to be is illustrating is something called the spherical aberration. And it's something good for you to be aware of, but I don't know if we spend much time with that. Um, and, and this uh, uh, kind of relates to one of the opening discussion this week. And um, yeah, let me not say too much there since I don't want to ruin it for people who haven't responded yet. Um, yeah, so so the, the, so I will say this, uh, a lot of the things you see in the textbook, you will see it done both in the textbook and in the lecture. And I will tell you, it's good for you to see both. Um, uh, try to read it through the textbook, seeing if you understand the argument, one. And two, watch the lecture. And um, the, the in this repetition is when you can um, make sure that you understand some things that are important and also highlight when you haven't quite understood something. So, and uh, so your textbook goes through this derivation uh, uh, and this uh, consideration of this uh, geometry to uh, derive this uh, formula, uh, which you will actually see quite a bit, um, uh, this formula here. And so you will see this in the context of mirrors and you will see it in the context of lenses. I think I usually call this a thin lens equation. And uh, this is probably the single most uh, important formula in this chapter. It, you see it applied in a wide variety of situations. Sometimes in situations that you didn't imagine applying it in when it was first introduced. So um, yeah, and, and the, the, the ray tracing rules, um, it, it's useful to read it through. I, I think uh, the rules like this, when you read it through it, you will kind of see that it doesn't tell you anything that's new um, because the when it tells you that ray traveling parallel goes through the focal point, yeah, that's kind of what a focal point does. And um, when a ray traveling along a line that goes through the center of curvature that reflected back along the same line. Yeah, that's what law of reflection means because at the center line here, it's this uh, tangent point is perpendicular. So of course, incident outgoing angle should be the same. So these rules, they don't really tell you anything new. Their importance is in highlighting what's uh, uh, useful in analyzing these things. And you, we have ray tracing rules for mirrors and we have ray tracing rules for lenses. And there's um, quite a bit of similarity when you look at it in detail. And I will tell you one thing that you will see in the lecture. Um, some of these rays are, um, they are redundant. So uh, this ray is redundant and uh, that ray is also redundant. Um, and so when you are trying to locate the image, the only rays you need are this and this. And um, so uh, I guess I'll just leave that there. Um, you will see that I have a preference for dealing with the lenses. And um, that's because there's a really a similarity in how you handle mirrors and how you handle lenses. And when it comes to drawing figures and all that stuff, um, lenses are easier. So, <laughs> um, but uh, as long as you pay attention to the sign convention, um, they end up in the same. One thing I will say is the, um, I, 
there's a care you need to pay to in stating the sign convention, you will hear the care that I give in the lectures. Um, your textbook does it slightly differently, which um, if you misapply, it can be confusing. So I'll just tell you to watch out. Uh, uh, this section is probably the section that we spend the least amount of time on. And uh, it is useful material. I would uh, encourage you to spend some time trying to understand the geometric arguments. Uh, where it is most useful is in driving uh, what's called lens maker's formula, which isn't this, that's just the refraction at one curved surface, but you can do it for two surfaces and doing it for two surfaces gets you this thing called lens maker's formula. So this is the setup for that. And when you go through the derivation, then, um, derivation, yeah, here, then you get this expression that's called uh, lens maker's formula. And I think there are some, a couple questions, more questions where you do need to use it. And this is a kind of formula that I would just uh, make sure that you know where to look it up from and uh, how to, yeah, where to look it up from. A drive, being able to drive it is something that I would have you be able to do because it, I, I mean, it's a, I think it, it's a satisfying intellectual exercise to learn, but uh, for me to require it is, I don't know if it's worth the trouble of requiring it. So, uh, but make sure that you know uh, where the lens maker's formula is. And, and this is the thin lens equation that uh, looks almost identical to the curved mirror equation it, because they kind of can be used similarly. Oh, wait, wait, yeah. So this is lens maker's equation, sorry. Um, it, that's uh, basically applying this to this expression to get a formula for the focal length given parameters of a lens. Um, yeah, uh, I think this section is the good place to talk about how, how the magnification. So the images that they show here are useful. Uh, it's kind of showing some of the examples. And these are the scenarios where the size of the object and the size of the image are actually different. So here the image, up, well, it's a drawn on diagram, image appears to be smaller than the object and they are actually smaller. So uh, when you are looking at these light rays from this side here, um, in order to uh, have something that looks exactly like this image, what you need to have is something that's exactly this size placed at this location. And the image, the virtual image that's formed by this lens, it is at this location and it is actually smaller than the object. And uh, with something like these lenses, you can, so in the lecture, you will see me uh, work out two different scenarios with a converging lens and you can form either real image like this, or you can form a virtual image. And um, in the case of virtual image with a converging lens, it's always going to be larger than the object. And in the case of the real image, you can actually have the scenario where the real image is larger than the object or smaller than the object. And that's what leads to the linear magnification and um, and I, I want to kind of set, make sure that uh, you treat this as two distinct things. The actual size of the image, which refers to the, the linear scale of the image with the, what we sometimes call apparent size of the image or it's angular size of the image. And, um, you know, something that is the same size, like my thumb, it'll appear larger if it's closer to you and it'll appear smaller if it's farther from you. And, um, and that's something that sometimes we refer to when that distinction is useful. But when we talk about the linear magnification of uh, optical system, we are not referring to that. We are referring to the actual size of image. The image has an actual size. So this is what I was referring to when I was talking about the, the plane mirror that the the size of the image that the mirror forms is the same as object. Mirror magnification is one. Um, now the 
the image in the mirror appear may appear smaller because the image is farther away than the mirror is or farther away than the object is but um, but the actual size of the image itself is not it, the play mirror doesn't shrink it down and I, so I think all this uh, goes back to understanding the role of image in the optical analysis. Um, I think that's uh, probably all the time I have to do an overview of the sort. The rest are kind of applications and um, and I'll, so normally we um, leave these two sections or understanding of topics in these two sections to the lab. Um, I'll give that some thought as I write up your lab manual. I have a, like one lecture for multi-lens arrangement, which can apply to microscopes and telescopes. Um, um.